So welcome uh, to the 2020 Glunn's Tasting Hall, uh, being hosted today by Pacific Highway. Uh, Pacific Highway has three great producers uh, that they've brought today, and I want to uh, welcome them all. And uh, I want to start by welcoming uh, Carrie. Carrie, it is awesome to have you in the house, and great to uh, have you here. And I love the background. Uh, that is spectacular. I think it's the best background we've seen so far. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. Same shirt. It's like you're there right now. You just came in. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, share a little bit of a quick uh, Google Earth uh, thing here. Yes, I am a, a little bit of a, a tech geek. But uh, let's see uh, where we're going today really quick. So here we are in planet Earth. Oh, look at that. There's Chicago. Yeah, I'm a geek for sure. Uh, but here is the uh, beautiful city of Chicago where most of us are, uh, are coming from. Uh, and we are going to uh, move on to our first stop, backing out and heading down south to Uruguay. So here is uh, Uruguay in relation uh, to where it stands in uh, South America uh, and to Argentina and Chile. Uh, and then we are going to sneak right in to this beautiful view of Bodega Garzón. And uh, with that, I will uh, stop sharing this uh, very cool map. But if you check out those vineyards, it's pretty sweet. Uh, this map, this picture does not do it justice, but... Uh, on that note, Carrie, welcome and thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Folk with Pacific Highway, and we're going to be walking you through three wineries. Um, we're fortunate enough to have representatives from two of them, and um, there is a congruent theme. Uh, these wineries are all owned by Alejandro Bulgaroni, which we'll speak to um, kind of throughout the presentation, and then also speak to another theme that runs um, through all of them, and that's sustainability and organic practices, because it's a uh, huge investment on part of Bolgaroni and you'll see it shine through not just in how delicious the wine is but in the overall the overall story of each winery. So with that being said I would like to let pass the mic over for a little bit to our friends hailing from both hemispheres. So first and foremost Christian Wiley. He is the managing director of Garzon hailing from Punta del Este that little beach town you saw next to Garzon. Uh, then all of, also Alec Griffith, um, hailing from Punta del Este as well, about 30 miles from this vineyard. And he's going to be the export director. And from Seattle, but by way of Uruguay, Mele Sosa, who is our U.S. brand ambassador. Some of you have met her in the past. She's been in Chicago a couple times. And yeah, I, um, I'm excited to show you a little bit about what we have. So we're going to kind of go back and forth with some PowerPoint presentations. I'm going to start first by sharing my screen because Christian has some very recent exciting stuff to share with you. So I'll let Christian take over. All right. Buenas tardes. How, how's everybody over there? Friends of Glantz and friends of Garzón. Um, we've been... Uh, Super, we're super excited to, to have uh, the official news that came in yesterday. Um, Bodega Garzón has been invited or have been incorporated in the top 100 wineries of, of wine and spirits for the first time, any, any Uruguayan producer. So we're, we're really stoked, uh, very happy, and um, we're sure this will, this will motivate the team and continue improving our wines. We had a fantastic 2020 harvest back in back in March. So we just look forward to bringing some some great, great liquids up to the US. Thank you. Congratulations. That is uh, absolutely fantastic and huge news, Christian. Uh, you and your team are just doing an amazing job. And it is so great to see you hit uh, one high to the next and uh, the wines are uh, well deserved for it. Gracias. Muchas gracias. We had them wait until just before this fall show to release that news, so I thought it was appropriate. But now I'll let Alec um, walk through a few more things about the winery, um, leading off with one of their other great accolades received in 2018. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, uh, well, thank you all. It's a pleasure to, to be here, and, and it's a great opportunity for us to, to teach a bit more about Garzón and Uruguay, uh, given we are so far 
away from, from Chicago. Uh, but briefly on this picture, what you see, well, apart from <laughs> the big uh, New World Winery of the Year logo, that's the winery. Um, and, and I just want to take a minute to explain the, the whole picture because um, on the bottom part, you see the winery, uh, which has the restaurant, the tourism, and all the product, productive facility. But you can also see the vineyards planted in very small blocks and parcels in these rolling hills. And in the back, in the horizon, that's the Atlantic Ocean, just 11 miles away. So during the presentation and while we taste the wines, we'll explain why we are located here. But it's basically that proximity to the ocean that gives a, lot, a beautiful freshness and acidity to the wines. So before jumping into the details of the winery, I always like to explain a bit about Uruguay because it's a small country uh, people haven't heard much about. It's uh, 3.4 million people, so small city in the US, um, but really good uh, literacy rate, really good public education, uh, and, and something that, you know, why people don't hear much about Uruguay is because it's quite stable um, and there's not too much noise. Um, you know, not too much news from Uruguay. It's not uh, as crazy as Argentina and Brazil, where you always hear something going on. Uh, Uruguay is very stable and, and boring in that way. Um, but something very important for us that we always like to mention, basically, when, when you talk about Southern Hemisphere wine regions and, and, and DOs, you always talk about Mendoza in Argentina or Maipo in Chile. Uh, Stellenbosch in South Africa and, and Barros in Australia. So Uruguay is actually the same exact latitude. It's parallel 35, where we have the same sun exposure as all these top Southern Hemisphere wine regions. But uh, because it's a small producer and we don't export much, people don't know about it. But the, the, basically the conditions are, are ideal for wine growing. Um, Specifically in Garzón, where we are, this is the southeast of Uruguay. We saw it in, in, in Joe's trip through Google Earth, which was great. Thanks, Joe, for that. Um, but basically, Garzón, if you see in the top corner, top right corner of, of the screen, that's Garzón. It's the name of the county and the town where just next to the vineyard and the winery. So we took in the name from, from the town and the county. But this whole area, this region is uh, very busy for tourism. Basically, Uruguay is kind of a, a summer destination, really hot um, and, and styly. There's a lot of really good restaurants, and an amazing gastronomic scene, but also a lot of nightlife, uh, celebrities. It's kind of a um, out of the beaten path destination. Uh, and this small town next to the winery with the the lighthouse you see it's Jose Ignacio, which is kind of a hippie chic uh, town, ex fisherman town. Today's long beaches, everyone dressed in white, very nice. So basically, I'm inviting you in your winter in December, January, February, come and visit us. It's summer here, and you'll have an amazing time. You can visit the winery. Um, this is just some pictures of, of the area. Punta Leste is kind of a, a, a Ibiza kind of city or Monaco with casinos, nightclubs. Jose Ignacio is more like a Saint-Tropez, really relaxed um, and, and, you know, cool area. And Garçon town is basically 200 people. It's a very small town. It's a, a rural town, forgotten in time. It's kind of like a cowboy town, um, or not even a town. It looks like a cowboy movie scene abandoned. <laughs> Uh, you walk the streets, there's nothing around, but one really famous restaurant called Garçon, which is Francis Malman's um, culinary mecca for, for his followers. This is where he, he developed a lot of his projects. Um, now going into the winery itself, the Garçon is the vision of the gentleman in, in, in the middle of the screen, Alejandro Bulgheroni. Um, Carrie will talk more about him in, in, in his global uh, projects in France and in Argentina, but Uruguay was, uh, Garçon was his first wine investment. And basically he coming from the energy business, um, he always had the vision of developing this area in, in, in a, the most sustainable way, taking care of the environment, 
Um, and he, he saw this like potentially as a little Tuscany. So that explains how the vineyard is planted um, and the whole philosophy behind the project. Um, you can, yeah, here you'll see a picture of the vineyards. So what I was explaining is you see very small parcels, blocks. There's 1,500 today um, and 16 different grapes. So in the area, there was no vineyards around. In 2008, when, when basically Mr. Rigoni started planting the vineyards, um, the, given there was no vineyards around, he had to do a lot of experimentation. For that, he brought Alberto Antonini, the famous flying winemaker from, from Tuscany, he used to be Antinori's winemaker, kind of to bring the knowledge um, and see if vines could grow and which varieties could grow. So today we have 16 different grapes. Our focus is Tanat, Albariño, Sauvignon Blanc, Marcelan, and Cap Franc. So today we'll taste Tanat and Cabernet Franc. Um, but here basically in, in the image on the map, you can see all the different grapes and how they're planted. So basically the big secret is playing with different orientations of, of each parcel towards the sun and towards the ocean. That's how we can have whites and reds in the same property. Um, this is the winery itself. Um, since day one, as I mentioned, Mr. Boroni coming from the energy business, he wanted to develop this project as sustainable as possible. So basically the whole construction took six years to build the winery, but um, it's the first LEED certified winery um, outside the US. And it's actually the first LEED, cer LEED certified winery in the world to get each of its productive areas certified. So the restaurant inside the winery, the productive area, the bottling facility, the club, the vineyard. Um, as you can see, it's the biggest green roof in Latin America. We produce our own energy with windmills. Uh, it's a gravity fed winery. And so we use very little pumps and, and low energy consumption and a closed circuit of water. So we reprocess uh, all the water as well. Um, basically here you see the concrete tanks. This is also part of the philosophy as we didn't want to impact the environment and we also believe in impacting the less uh, in winemaking. So it's basically the minimum intervention winemaking. The concrete uh, plays a huge role in this. Um, Mele will talk more, a bit more about that when we taste the wines. And this is just a picture of our aging room. It's all untoasted French oak. We use big casks, basically, well, I don't want to steal Mele Thunder there, but it's, uh, it's proving amazing results for us, big casks. Um, basically, this is a, we'll just show a, a picture of the whole portfolio of wines. So we have the Reserva tier, which we'll taste two today, single vineyards, um, and Balasto, our icon. Um, so I'll let Mele go through through this. She's she's the winemaker, much much expert than me, uh, and much more passionate as well. So go ahead, Mele. A lot of passion. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. Well, thank you, Alec. Thank you, uh, Glance and and friends, Pacific Highway as well. Um, for having us uh, today and uh, yes, as, as um, Alec was mentioning, um, the philosophy of, of Garçon is just respecting what Mother Nature gives us. In this beautiful terroir that was, we were pioneers, there was nothing before um, and like Kari liked to mention, this was like a Jurassic Park because we have palm trees and a lot of um, native vegetation, uh, beautiful birds. Actually, Uruguay means river of uh, beautiful birds. Um, Mother Nature in this experiment gave, gave us these beautiful wines in this portfolio. We have probably a wine for every single type of food. Uh, two be beautiful whites, the Sauvignon Blanc and the Albariño, which is beautiful. And a rosé made out of Pinot Noir. And a Marcelin, uh, uh, that is uh, probably our first step in reds, and Tanat and Cabernet Franc. The ones that you are tasting today is Cabernet Franc and Tanat, 
And I'm very proud of, to talk about these two, especially the Tanat. This Tanat is the national grape of Uruguay. As Malbec is from Argentina, um, Tanat is the Uruguayan flag. And in the land of Curzon, next by the Atlantic Ocean with beautiful granitic soils, one of the most Asian soils in the world, the balasto, we call it balasto, the soil. Um, the Tanat, we can probably say it's tamed, it's a smooth. Look at this glass, the Tanat is very, very dark. It's a wine that uh, since it's in the glass and you haven't tasted yet, uh, it's, it's very inviting. Uh, it's the darkest, uh, wine is the darkest grape because Tanat is four times more concentrated than Cabernet Sauvignon in terms of phenolic contents and tannins. But when you put it in your mouth, it's, uh, it's very, it explodes. The, the, the acidity and the tension is very beautiful. It's juicy. It represents the soil of Garçon, but it's very velvety and smooth. Um, the, the origin of Tanat, as many, uh, as you might know, is Madirane, Southwest France. It was taken to my country at the end of 17th century. And, and this wine makes Garçon very proud because we reached the top 100 wine spectators, uh, spectator a few years ago, but the accolades keep coming. And I know among wine people, accolades probably it's, but for us, for an, an unknown region, has been very important. We, Gerson, it's writing the history of my country, of Uruguay, and I'm re really, really proud of this wine. Um, also the Cabernet Franc, it's a wine that, um, as Alec mentioned, we respect uh, Mother Nature, so it's fermented in concrete with native yeasts, and uh, all our reds after fermenting spent in between six to 12 months in French oak. Uh, we are using cask big containers to avoid oxidation and to minimize the intervention of oak. And the result is a very smooth, approachable wines. They have really good potential for aging, but they are perfect for drinking right now. I can imagine the seasons that are coming, uh, Thanksgiving, and I hope every table in the world, well, I would say in Chicago or <laughs> <laughs> in Illinois had a Gerson wine to celebrate. Um, before I forget and something that we forgot, we are a very golf um, uh, family. I know that there's so many golf courses and many people play golf in Chicago and we are PGA, uh, sponsors of the PGA Tour because we have a beautiful um, golf course, PGA uh, golf preferred golf course in, in, in Gerson. So I also invite you to go there and and play golf with us. Well, right, we we're going to take you up on that offer. <laughs> While we see wine, maybe rosé or Albarino next by the, the ocean. Oh, that me. sounds spectacular. What's, what's your handicap, Joe? <laughs> I'm so good I don't have one. <laughs> now that we've got the wine in your glass. I have the, I have the same one. <laughs> We wanted to give you a better understanding. Um, we've kind of laid the groundwork for Garzon, but the staff at Garzon also worked with a beautiful camera crew um, to create a video to kind of bring you there and give you a sense of place. So I'm gonna just play this one um, oh, minute and a half long video that can just really show that it is legit, the 1993 classic film, Jurassic Park. <laughs> Some believe that destiny is already written, an immutable legacy. Others see destiny as an opportunity. It starts with a dream, a revealing vision, an emotion that takes shape, the dawn of a new era. Tradition becomes state of the art. A place becomes inspiration. Innovation and nature in perfect harmony evoke the energy of its soil. To look beyond, to go beyond, Thank you. 
In Garçon, the best is always yet to come. All right, I, uh, I wanted to pull up something really professional at this time um, that I thought would be a really cool representation of what you just saw. Um, so you see where we fall in the world, and I don't know if you guys recall, but elementary school Pangea, the original rock formation of the continents, uh, we are right in the center of that, and we're on top of what Meili referred to as the Balasto soil. And this weathered granite has some serious history. And Meili, you might be able to help me, but this is, if you guys don't follow my Instagram, it's, um, it's chicks doing bro things, but I have a video, which let's see, or I don't know if it'll work with my background. Uh, one second, I just stopped showing my background. Um, but it is uh, of the ferns that the, the lead certification of, of the winery has required little parts um, to be, let's see, oh shoot, I'm sorry, this isn't working. Oh, none, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, some boulders to basically not be obstructed and left in place. And at this point, there's sunlight that has to fall in every room as part of a lead certification. And in that process, this fern emerged. I just took a picture because I thought it was cool. But Mele, you had some fascinating information about this fern that it can tell us more about where we are in the world. Well, this fern, uh, once they they broke the the granite the solid granite uh, and with the sun with the sunlight um in, uh, a fern bloomed and there's no ferns in the area uh, we we found the sister soil in 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 africa from um, angola to nigeria is the sister soil and it seems that a spore of the fern was trapped uh, before the continent separated and with the breakage of the soil, the, the fern bloom. So there's botanists all over the world kind of trying to study that, that fern and it's there. You can also go and visit and walk through the granite of the walls of, of Garzon and admire and take pictures of the fern. <laughs> I just thought that was super cool. I've never heard of anything like that. So with that <laughs> being said, um, I'm going to come back to the sharing our I music. see familiar faces there <laughs> all right yeah so yeah it's a it's a really beautiful place to visit and I also want to thank as we look to the portfolio you guys had tried um, what we thought appropriate for fall weather um, of course the Tanat the leader about for half the sales of the winery um, also the Cab Franc um, both just great big reds perfect for every cut of the cow <laughs> as there is four cows for every human in Uruguay. But the wonderful distributor Glunz um, represents every single one of the wines. So everything you see in front of you is available um, today um, to try, to buy, um, but an extensive array of what they produce. I will say I did get to try the first vintage of Garzon Tanat. It was actually in Chicago um, and it was 2012 vintage. So we're looking at a, a winery that's got history, got pedigree, but it's, it's still quite new. Although the fern is not new. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you so much. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Alec take over talking about how, how wonderful the winery. Yeah, uh, well, this is just some of our accolades. To be honestly speaking, uh, we, we are all very, very impressed. And how, you know, I think how we ex explains basically a lot of critics and, and competitions are really eager to find new, you know, new and interesting wines from new origins, new varieties. So I guess it's something interesting for them to talk about, but we're getting a lot of accolades. Um, now, of course, not disregarding the amazing job the technical team are doing with the wines. Uh, but as we mentioned, the New World Winery of the Year by Wine Enthusiast, um, the restaurant got the best restaurant, you know, in a winery uh, by Decanter. Basically, the, the culinary director of this restaurant is Francis Malman. Uh, you probably have heard about him cooking with fires. He's the, the king of the barbecue and fires. Um, this actually, we haven't updated, but the, the world best vineyards, we got the second place, uh, 2019 and 2020, just a couple of weeks ago. So really, really uh, proud of, of the consistency you know, of the experience. 
and this is something I wanted to invite you all to to enjoy. Maybe some of you have watched it watched it already, but it's in Amazon uh, Prime. It's called It Starts with Wine. It's a, a series of uh, nine episodes, and each winery is one episode. And the pilot episode, the, the first episode, is Bodega Garçon. So you'll see there Alberto Antonini uh, talking about the wines and, and the terroir and Francis Malman doing all the cooking. So it's really, really interesting and fun. Uh, 35 minutes, I think it is. Um, and I think we are kind of running out of time, uh, but free to ask, uh, sorry, to answer any questions you might have. Uh, we're here for that. Um, one, just one interesting fact that I forgot to mention about Uruguay. Um, remember, 3 million people, very small, but 12 million cows. So there's actually four cows per person. Um, that basically explains how we are uh, number one per capita meat consumption in the world. But it also explains why Tanat is our you know, uh, iconic national grape. It's a fantastic, fantastic pairing, um, you know, uh, red meat and, and tanat. Basically, the tannins of the tanat cut through the fat very nicely, and you have an amazing experience there. And it has more resveratrol than any other grape, so I call it nature's Botox. Yeah. So, Mele is well, a only, only from Kerry. I'm 108. <laughs> I'm a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions out in the uh, in the group? Please feel free to uh, unmute to uh, ask any questions or just throw them in the chat, uh, and I will uh, go ahead and and uh, progress through those. Just take a second here for anybody if they're uh, interested. Thank you for sending the link too. For it starts with wine. That video is about twenty five minutes. It's, um, it's beautiful. It is. It's spectacular. It's a, actually a very cool series, but you know they uh, brought out the you know best for the first. So, yeah, N none of the other ones are anywhere near as cool. And, and if you have the the tanat in your house already, it's a perfect to watch. You know, with glass of tanat and watch the the episode is really cool. And he's tanat kidding. <laughs> Terrible. Sorry. <laughs> Well, Alec and, and Mele and Christian, I think, had to go to Brazil. Um, so I want to thank you guys for your time. Uh, we're going we're gonna to now take everybody to Argentina, which I think Fantastic. Joe will Fantastic. Um, Salud, uh, amigos. Thank you. Hasta luego. Muchas gracias. Bye. Very nice to see you all. Thanks for your time. It was great seeing you guys. Thanks for, for the whole day. Bye, Joe. Thanks. Ciao. Bye. All right, and uh, I am going to move it back here to our uh, Google Earth here. And uh, let's see here. And while he's doing that, um, I'm, you may see a new face. Uh, Maximo Roca is now joining us from Buenos Aires. He is the International Export Director for Argento Winery. Um, he knows a lot, and we're very grateful for you being here, Maximo. Uh, Maximo, thank, you, thank so you for being here as well. <laughs> Hi, Joe. How everybody? It's again a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Carrie, for your nice introduction. Well, we are moving not so far from Uruguay, from Garzón Winery. We are now, let's say, in Argentina, in, in Mendoza. So uh, I, I, I would like to, I don't know if we're going to show the presentation, Carrie, or... The yeah, ACC. I Okay, good. I like, I like. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So, see, does that look familiar? Yes, very good. Awesome. Fantastic. All right, now I'll stop being a, a, a tech geek and uh, get right back to you, Maximo. No, but it's pretty important because at the end, this uh, introduction in, uh, with the Google Earth or, or the direction of Argento is a good, let's say, link and, and, and a good uh, past uh, to me because uh, the intention of today is to talk about Argento wines. I have here. Uh, both Regento, Pinot Grigio, and, and Malbec, and, and maybe some of the audience or, or people in, in the room are not aware, but um, for, uh, just uh, a couple of, let's say, months ago, we have been certified uh, organic, the, the whole production of the northern uh, vineyards in, in Argentina, in Mendoza. So today, Avinea Group, who, who is the, the, the owner of Argento Winery, is the biggest organic producer in Argentina with uh, 
I would say more than 300 hectares in Argentina, but with almost 300 in, in Mendoza. And for us, it's a very, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great milestone because uh, the philosophy of, of Mr. Burioni family, who owns Argento and also Garzón, when they decided to join in this beautiful wine industry, the, the first intention was to really go back to the origins of making wines and going back to the roots. Uh, Argentina is a, a country of immigrants and we always um, uh, started to do wine since the beginning. So here in the slide, we can see the, the, the main uh, vineyards of Argento in Mendoza. And uh, three out of five uh, vineyards has been certified organic. For your information, Joe, and the rest, the picture that you shown, you just shown uh, of Bodega uh, Argento is the one that says Maipú. So it's, it's, it's in the, in the, in, it's below. So the Maipú and Medrano is going to be certified next year and more and more we're going to be the number one uh, organic producer in, in Argentina. And the intention is to go back to, to the uh, way of doing uh, wine because it's completely different. Well, of course, it, it took a lot of time to really have the possibility to have this wine being organic because you know that first of all, you need to clean all the, the, the former, let's say, way of uh, doing the wines in the vineyards, clean the soils, and then start it to, uh, uh, to be organic. And it's like when you are going to the gym, uh, uh, first of all, if you, want, if you don't want to, to, to maybe grow your muscles really faster without any kind of pills, it, it takes uh, much more time. And, and I think that this is the beauty of now having the possibility to, to show you what, what we achieve. And organic, if we go one slide more, uh, Kari, it's very important because it was coming from, from the one making team. And, and, and I would like to you to introduce Juan Pablo Murgia. Juan Pablo Murgia has been, uh, let's say, appointed as a Grupo Avinea head wine maker last year. We are very proud. He was working in, in the group for many, many years. Of course, he was working, uh, he's still working in Otronia, the winery in Patagonia, but also he, he was working in Bodega Vistalva. Maybe you know Vistalva, Corti B, Corti A, Corti C, and also Chomero. So he, he has a, a very a good uh, trajectory uh, in, in the wine business, but also he was working with Alberto Antonini. And Alberto Antonini is, is, is our consultant for, for the whole, let's say, wineries around the world, but he's also traveling to, to, to Mendoza, to Argento. And both of them uh, were part of this very successful story uh, behind the, the running production. And for us, the organic production is, is not only about to go back to, to the origin of how we are doing wine, it's also because the consumer, the US consumer in this case, we can see that the organic consumer are looking for organic wines. And, and, and I think that beyond the philosophy of Argento Winery and the Bulgaroni family, it's a good added value uh, to communicate this to the American consumers. Of course, on top of the organic production, we also um, certify, we just certify the, 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 vine, the winery, sorry, as sustainable and also vegan. But I think that, that the organic production to go back to the roots is the most important thing. So uh, here we have the two best sellers. So uh, let's start with the white. This is a Pinot Grigio, number first best seller worldwide. Maybe you are not aware, but Argento has presence in more than 50 countries. And this is our best seller. Is also the second bestseller in the full range of Argento. And maybe you, you can see here, but uh, this is coming from, from high altitude vineyards, from, from Agrelo. And also the Malbec classic with good scores, number one bestseller, and the one that uh, make famous uh, the Argentinian Malbec. And, and I know that usually people or consumers that are seeking for uh, Argentinian wines are always asking for Malbec. But now, on top of the Malbec, we have other varieties. So I let Carrie to talk more about the, 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 the wines and the pricing, because for us it's very important. Yeah, first and foremost, I, I really like to express, as, uh, as Maximo put it, they're, they're widely known internationally. They're sold in 50 countries, but, but most importantly, they're sold within Argentina. Um, I can't emphasize enough when you're in this kind of competitive price point, quite often you're drinking a wine that is manufactured, there's a label strapped on it, and it's not sold in the US. 
or so, sold in Argentina. So it is consumed in the home country, which is great. Um, we speak to that Pinot Grigio, and um, in the morning presentation, I was joking, I was trying to find a flashlight, and I couldn't, but so I'm just gonna use sunlight, but basically, where you are, where that Pinot Grigio grows is some of the brightest light I've ever seen. I, I, the pictures that we took as a team when we were down there, we all look like we're being blinded. But what that does, um, so you hear this high elevation, as Maximo was speaking to on the Pinot Grigio, it provides a higher UV content than you're seeing in pretty much um, most other varieties grown. We're so high up in elevation that you get so much more going on with the wine. I, I like to joke, Pinot Grigio often is two things. It's wet and it's cold, um, and sometimes Maybe you're lucky to get a little fruit, but this is probably the longest, I like to say the most talkative Pinot Grigio I've ever had. I mean, as you're sipping it, it stays on your tongue. Um, it's got the ability to handle some heavier handed, maybe fatter fishes and, and just more application than just being a quaffable patio pounder, as we like to put it. Um, so that being said, you're also trying the classic Malbec. So the classic Malbec, um, first and foremost, was exported to the UK before it came to the US. So speaking to that style when people manufacture, um, and I use the word manufacture, especially Malbec, to fit the palate of the American consumer, we often find extraction, kind of a syrup bomb, higher alcohol, whereas this I find to be more quaffable, crunchable, um, and balanced, as opposed to what you see um, often in this price set. Um, and then another note of just, uh, just disclosure, what you're trying, um, and I'm gonna come back to the packaging, are these two bottles in front of you. We wanted to show you this, um, but we're gonna be transitioning to the new organic packaging when it arrives at the end of this year. Um, but within the same set and price point, we also have Cabernet and Bonarda, which I, I love Bonarda. Um, and those are all available to sell at Blunds. And you're seeing your suggested retail price, you know, sale $9.99 and very, very affordable for by the glass viability um, as well. So um, I was also always the philosophy of, of the, the whole Argento team was to uh, over deliver uh, value versus price. And, and I think that we achieved that for, for a long time. And in this case, because the idea was to do the transition, uh, well, it's the same with Argento Reserva. Argento Reserva is also coming from the same vineyards. And, and of course, the, the main difference is the, the, the aging in oak barrels. Uh, but uh, as uh, just Gary said, uh, the idea is to do the transition in the labeling. Of course, it was not easy to do that because we have presence in more than 50 countries and the intention was to do it, let's say, homogeneously and at the same time. But we decided to start first with the U.S. market. So the first new labeling of Argento Reserva, uh, sorry, uh, organic, is going to be in the U.S. states very soon. So I don't know if you want to to tell more about the label, the like curry, but it's a simple uh, differences, but uh, al always highlighting the, the organic production. Yeah, so we've recently done an upgrade to the packaging um, just a couple of years ago and didn't want to deviate from that, but still add the organic certification. So you can see we've kind of um, just added a subtle leaf and then stated on the front of the label made with organic grapes. You'll see that also on the Reserva line, which we do um, carry at Glens as well with Chardonnay and Malbec, and that's more subtly stated, but also on the front of the label. Uh, and then, not in your glass, not in the US yet. I haven't even tried it, but we also are going to be launching a new Coming soon. Very soon, um, which will be... <coughs> there we go, the Minimalista line. Um, so, Maxima, I can let you speak to this. Um, the direction with this portfolio of wines? Um. Well, the intention was always we were looking to, 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 to find or to, let's say, deliver a good wine uh, in a different style to the uh, young consumers that are more and uh, more growing. And the intention of Minimalista was to have a, a different brand, maybe co-branded by Argento, uh, but not organic. Yes, uh, of course, uh, it's going to be sustainable because the wine has been certified sustainable. But the intention is to, 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 to offer to the young, young people or the people that maybe are starting to consume wine uh, a very uh, easy to drink uh, wine, uh, even if it's uh, Malbec, if it's Pinot Grigio or Rosé, very fruity and a really affordable price because we are, for the first time, uh, let's say, uh, trespassing the barrier of minus $8 a bottle. So I think that this is a regular price. Of course, maybe we will have a lower pricing in, in some, let's say, occasions. But it's something that will will come soon, and the intention of Curry was to do a kind of a one premiere for all Glance team and all all people here, and and for for us it was very nice to show you now. 
Yeah. So you're looking at if, if there's opportunity once when we can again, event wine, happy hour wine, we're about $5 and five and change by the glass. But like I said, this is yet to come, but I felt this is a great platform. You guys express interest in the winery. So we felt you to be some of the first to get a glimpse of what's coming. They always say the same because we are looking at a bottle of wine in a presentation, but for sure the label and the texture of not only Minimalista, the Malbec, State Classic and State Reserva is completely different when you have the bottles in your hands. All right, so that being said, um, sip yes. on that Grigio or Malbec. We're gonna give you another quick journey through. Hopefully we can all travel soon someday and go to South America, but without further ado, here's Argento's video. Yes. Carrie, you want to try hitting uh, pause on that and then rewind it a little bit? Uh, we lost that sound again. I think if I mute, maybe then we lose it. Okay. Yes, that is uh, that is exactly what happens. I've done that. like the end, the real Argentina, because at the end, Argento, you know, that is like to say, Argentinian citizens. And that for us, it's, it's very easy to connect with, with Argentinian citizen culture and history of uh, an immigrant uh, country. So from my side, um, before maybe going to the questions, um, I would like to, to thank to everybody. I think that we have a huge opportunity with these uh, uh, two wines, the best sellers, to start preparing the ground where upon the arrival of, of the new labels that will come very soon to the US. I think that we have a, a very successful uh, brand, uh, two successfully, let's say, varietals like Pinot Grigio and Malbec. And, and if we can do this in advance, and prepare the ground, I think that when the organic labels will come, we will have another value, uh, easy to uh, enhance the consumer and customer experience. Thank you, Maximo. <laughs> Um, if anyone has any questions, um, otherwise we want to try and keep it concise to an hour. I appreciate you dedicating this much time to joining us today, but um, before doing so, does anyone have any, any questions for Maximo or about Argento in general? Hopefully one day you will, uh, we will have everybody potentially visiting Argentina, Mendoza. Yes, yes. please. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get on a plane. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I believe that the organic wines are, are, are the ones that are, are seeking more and more. And I think that this, for me, it's a very nice added value. And I, I, I didn't see any Argentinian wine organic in that price point. Never, ever. Yeah. That's a great point, Maximo. There really is uh, nothing, yeah. especially the sustainable price point um, at that entry tier with Minimalista. And then also, really competitive set, there's not really anything out there. So we're excited to be the number one organic producer. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Maximo. Maximo, thank you so much thank for you, Joe. taking your Muchas time gracias. out. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Have a nice sí. weekend. <laughs> Saludos sí. a la familia. Regards to the families and stay in touch. Eh? Ciao. Grazie. Ciao. 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 <laughs> Grazie. All right. And now we'll uh, jump back to uh, uh, Google Earth here. And uh, we'll move off of uh, this beautiful area here is Argentina. Let's see where we're heading. Heading back to the Northern Hemisphere here into France. So this is a nice little view, I think, of, uh, of all of Bordeaux. Uh, kind of scooch out here a little bit into uh, France and uh, see where we're heading in here. And then uh, here we are.
And then the cool part of this, which I will kind of geek out a little bit, is being able to really get a good view of the landscape here uh, that you can kind of see the valleys flowing right in and along there. Awesome. But I will uh, stop geeking out there and shoot back to uh, Carrie. Hello. All right. So I will be uh, your, French, your French ambassador today. Um, I, I'm really grateful we've been able to get the Southern Hemisphere team with us um, as they're going into their spring. Um, France is obviously wrapping up harvest and we have, um, we, we were unfortunately not able to have Monique um, Kenny from the winery um, come on board. She's, she's not only uh, working in the winery, but also she's CEO and does international sales. So she was traveling today, um, but I will share a little bit of a presentation on her behalf. So I'm um, going to share my screen. So the last two wines you have, um, kind of like Argento, what I call like the salt and pepper brother-sister duo. We've got a white and a red and um, more in kind of the entry level, quick expression of Bordeaux. And oops, oops. there we go. So um, kind of visible on the Google Earth uh, presentation from Joe, uh, we've got a, a, a little bit of history here. So Chateau Suo. Can we all say it? Everyone unmute yourself and say it with me. Suo, or say it silently to yourself, it's all right. But um, the French language can be fun and complicated. There's hidden letters, there's mispronunciations left and right. But this wine will not be changing its name as it dates back to the mid 16th century, along with the original winery that you see depicted in this etching. Um, it was slightly visible on the Google Earth um, image, but a lot of history here. So Chateau Suo, um, is still um, partly managed by the family that has had control for a number of years. But as I've said earlier, Alejandro Bolgaroni. So he is an um, energy billionaire from Argentina. So the reason I bring that up, and you know, it's, it's always fun to talk about billionaires and how great their lives are, but he is someone who applies what he knows and loves, and that's energy into all of his properties. So he actually found this, this is the only holdings he has in Bordeaux, but it's mainly because of the partnership that he made um, with this amazing woman right here. So Monique Bonet or Monique Kenny, um, she bought the winery from her father. So she was working in finance in Paris, um, corporate, all the works, and basically um, inheritance kind of brought her back. And she came back to the winery um, 30 years ago and was watching the first harvest and saw, you know, people working in the vineyards coming back with red faces, um, watering eyes and irritation. And it was because of all the pesticides and inorganic products or materials being used in the harvest. And so she took that and she started talking to her neighbors um, and really wanted to, to pioneer more organic practicing in Bordeaux. Um, uh, did fall on a deaf ear to quite a few producers next to her, near her, um, but that process she grew um, from 2005 to 2013, she worked and finally received organic certification. And we are looking at a winery that is the longest continuous organically certified vineyard in all of Bordeaux. If you guys wanna try and say that five times fast, um, I'll be proud of you. But, but that being said, I find that to be incredibly powerful. So she completed that certification in 13 um, that was helped and funded partially by Bulgaroni, who then took over half ownership in 2014. Um, but a little bit of where we are. So we're obviously in Bordeaux, but the main epicenter and actually the, the higher tier wine than what you have, uh, the Bordeaux Rouge and Blanc, we do have a Cadillac Rouge. So Cadillac may have a little familiarity for those that are from, who like cars. Um, I th thought this was kind of a fun fact that General Motors actually named the Cadillac after this region in Bordeaux um, because the western part of Michigan was primarily um, started by French Canadian fur trappers and they wanted to give an homage and what they thought to be an elevated level of luxury would be a kind of a, a French tie. So um, I was saying this earlier, we, we do well in Michigan with this wine um, because of that so, and because of what's in the glass. So that being said, um, you don't have the full bottle in front of you. You got those awesome um, two ounce pours, but something that's great and understated is the label itself. Um, so you're gonna see a classic Suwell label on the front, but on the back um, of the 750 bottles is a very clear explanation. Um, French wine can be confusing. Um, I know all of us here are familiar with a lot of the nuances of French production and labeling, but for the consumer um, or even you know, wait staff, sometimes they don't necessarily know the varietal breakdown. 
So obviously Bordeaux Blanc, we are Sauve Sem primarily. Um, pretty much year after year, uh, the white that you have in your glass is 80% Sauvignon Blanc, 20% Semillon. Um, we are currently tasting the 2018, but in about one month, we'll be moving to the 2019, which I'm gonna just show off. Uh, last week, we just got top 100 best buys, best value um, from Wine Enthusiast Magazine. That's taking into account tariff price increases. So we're looking at a buy the glass price on this wine right around $12, and then on the shelf, anywhere from $15.99 to $16.99. So an exceptional value. Um, crisp, clean, and I think just a, a, as Sauvignon Blanc, um, I don't know if you, if you guys follow Nielsen data, but Sauvignon Blanc in the last four weeks was up 38% as a variety. Um, I know that's heavily led by the New Zealand category, but the variety itself um, is known and adored in the U.S. So I think this is just pure opportunity, and it's a great clean wine. And then now to move to the next wine, the Bordeaux Rouge. I was asking this earlier, based on where we fall on the, this side of the river, does anyone happen to know what the majority variety is in the red wine in your glass? Anyone? So we're on the right bank, so it's 80% Merlot and 20% Cab. That, that percentage deviates slightly, but heavily Merlot in, in pretty much every single vintage. So um, what I like about that is you're getting kind of a little bit more medium body style um, versatility. So I spoke to Minimalista being a great opportunity for happy hour. I think this is just a great by the glass um, rouge, if you wanted to label it as such, or just a good go-to opportunity in, in the retail set. Um, they're both line priced and, um, and it, they have a story. So I think it's important to, to come back to Monique. Um, she herself, as I mentioned, is traveling everywhere. When I was with her in Michigan, she then went up to, to Canada, which is actually her second biggest market. She sells in all of the provinces um, within the, their own um, liquor trade. So she's a very hard worker and I have, I'm able to, if you're interested to do any one-on-one -on -one, um, interviews, if you would like to start working with the wine and have the staff of your, um, any establishment um, have any conversation with her, I, I find her to be a fascinating businesswoman. So I don't have more details on this yet, but I've actually um, proposed and we're still in the works of it, but we wanted to do a scholarship for women in the industry and I think she's a great example of someone who's just climbed and kicked some ass, if, you're, if, I, if you don't mind. Part of my French, <laughs> you like that? <laughs> um, so that being said, um, we, we're very proud to represent this winery. Um, Monique, as I said, did sell a stake of the ownership, but she's still an active player and CEO of the winery itself. So I hope you enjoyed um, both expressions of the Bordeaux Rouge and Blanc. Um, and if you guys have any questions about those wines, about the organic certification, um, or in general about any of the three properties we spoke about today, um, speak now, reach out to me later. Um, but aside from that, this has been an honor. Thank you. Carrie, thank you very much. Fantastic job yet again. Uh, uh, at this point, uh, usually the afternoon crowd always has a, is a little bit more vocal uh, with uh, questions. If there's any questions that you have, please feel free to uh, unmute uh, and or to uh, throw something in the chat to uh, ask uh, Carrie some questions. Or keep enjoying the wine. I'm fine with that too. Keep enjoying the wine. <laughs>